Hello everyone, I'm Grandmaster Adonis Borosh and this is how to become a Grandmaster. This time we are going to look at a special prodigy, although we are all going to look through different journeys of people getting to the top of their game and becoming a Grandmaster. The first one we're going to talk about is Richard Rapport, the rise of the Rapport. Now, I want to start off with a little bit of a puzzle, then we're going to take a look at the game itself. This one has been featured between Banos and Rapport. So it is black to move, and it is evident that Rapport is dominating here. However, Rapport finds the strongest continuation, which practically ends the game. Now, for all of you who don't know Rapport, he is one of the youngest grandmasters of all time. He became a grandmaster at the age of 13 and 11 months. So super young, just like many others, um, including the one here in St. Louis, Leonizhnik, who was a grandmaster at age 14. So. And that's a journey also that we're going to take a look at, see the struggles and the successes of how he eventually actually reached grandmasterhood. But for now, we are going to look at some critical games that he played for him to become a grandmaster. Meanwhile, hello everyone over here and hello chat. Great to see you being the GM in the res. Not quite, this is a lesson of its own, so um, this will be something you'll see every Wednesday. So it's interesting, uh, there was a message which is in the right direction. So one of the things that you should be looking for in these puzzles is to look for loose pieces and targets. So one of the biggest problems that White has is this coordination. Of course, you can't say the same thing about Black's position. Black has a beautiful knight on d5, a beautiful queen on e2. You can't really say the same thing about White's position as the bishop and the king are somewhat, well, it's relatively the best piece White has, but it's still kind of uh, firing away at a non-target. It's kind of a passive bishop. But the same thing about the queen on d8. That queen on d8 is actually undefended. So there is actually a way for us to take advantage of her situation. And of course, any ideas are welcome. Queen d1, okay, queen d1 check by al Hajj, And if I would continue with king g2, so check. I would go king g2 here. I was happy to win the bishop. Well, it's good to win the bishop, but hey, if you can win something uh, bigger, and half tier, you should go for that one. Mm -hmm. And if I capture? So H3, I capture. Before, H3 before mm -hmm. King D1. Oh, before. Yeah, it's actually an interesting move however white does have the threat of giving a perpetual so you don't really have the time for that because they just keep checking you but queen d1 is indeed the right way to go king g2 and Yep, knight e3, or, yep, it's a check, and there goes the queen. 
Uh, Chet is correct as well. Knight takes f4 is just as good. Maybe also wins a pawn. But what matters most that this is just completely winning. And of course, uh, Richard won the game. So this was a little bit of a puzzle from the game that we are actually going to take a look at. This has been played in the third event of um, the third norm. So anytime you're trying to become a grandmaster, you've got to win three events. And this was the third one for Richard. So he had to win it, score a lot of points. And if he does so, reaches the rating of 2,500, he will become a grandmaster. So knight f3, knight f6, c4, c5, not something unusual. Now for the initiated, look at the rating of white and the rating of rapport. Banus is actually much higher rated at this moment. But uh, as you'll see, rapport does not pay attention for the ratings. So knight c3, knight c6, d4, takes, takes, e6. And this is actually a very, very famous line. This has been featured in plenty of candidates events. Both of these players are professional. Banus actually uh, became a member of the Hungarian team as well as Rapport, of course. And um, for argument's sake, bishop f4, d5, knight b5, e5, takes, takes, takes. This has been featured in the candidates tournament between Viktor Korchnoi and Portish. Korchnoi, who would celebrate his birthday today. Now, in this game, Banus chose a3, which wants to restrict Rapport's play of bishop b4, which is a typical idea, as uh, black would try to ruin white's structure. So a3 is interesting, and in fact, a Korchnoi favorite too. a3, bishop e7, e4, castles. So if you look at this position, what can we sort of notice? White did get the center control, but what is uh, that one little thing that white is lacking? And not that white did too many things wrong, I may add. Rapport had uh, two GM norms, yes, and also he had many rating points in the bag already. So these are the ratings at the moment, and uh, the schedules, like, I think it's monthly now, so you get uh, the ratings out monthly, but before that, uh, you could get in a bulk, so they would calculate four uh, months of results altogether. So he could have been much higher rated, but it doesn't show. So White did play plenty of pawn moves. Very good observation there, al -Hajj. Uh The pawns take away too many moves. So because of that, White's king is sort of in the middle of the board. And Rapport is trying to counterbalance this with active play. So he goes for quick castling and in fact wants to play this pawn break. So if Banus doesn't really react, goes bishop to e2. He goes immediately with this break. And according to recent theory, this is supposed to be very much fine for black as white loses the grip of the center. No more of this Marozzi stranglehold in the middle. And probably the game sort of evens out as white manages to castle but loses the control of the center. Now, obviously, as Banus is an ambitious player, and higher rated at the moment, wants to keep the tension and goes for knight to c2. Knight to c2 is a weird looking move, but it makes sense. If white would face d5, then this would be captured and white just be up a pawn. So knight c2, and here Rapport does some of the people's favorite, and I wonder if you guys know this typical setup when either there's an e6 one or b6 one, and there's also g6, b6, which was an Dorian favorite, Andrasha Dorian's favorite, 
who was, I believe, the second of Kasparov at the Karpov Kasparov matches. So, do any of you know what are these structures called in this system? This is one of those elusive animal named openings. Oh, it's a hedgehog. It's the hedgehog, yes. Um, and it's called the hedgehog because it's spiky. It's very, very difficult to get to, and they actually pack a punch, as you'll see in this game. So Banus sort of feels the dangers, sees that d5 might be coming soon, so he's going for f4. So if Rapport tries to break free with d5, he might just go, nah, -uh, I'm going to push my pawn to e5 and push you back. So f4, and Rapport very elegantly and rightfully so keeps on developing. Bishop b7, bishop d3. Now, the fight really revolves around who controls the middle and whether white can control this center that he has. Because with big center comes big responsibilities, so Banus is actually quick to over-defend the e-pawn. f4 seems to be a little bit too much. Not really that so. I think f4 is ambitious. Yes, it does weaken this diagonal, but there aren't really any easy ways of exploiting that. If black would go something like bishop c5, then white would just chase the bishop away. And once Banus would consolidate, white is just much better because of the extra space and no real easy counterplay. So first thing that we can learn from Rapport, use quick development. It can't really hurt you. Yes, you have a little bit less space, but you're up ahead. You have something to play for. You have that king in the center that you can fight against. So rook c8, queen e2. And it's very interesting that Banus refuses to castle and is just waiting and just over defending all these crucial squares. It's a big strategical battle going on. All right, so here we have to look for a different way for us to break through. Because apparently d5 still runs into ideas of either takes, takes e5 or e5 immediately. So is there anything else we could try to target in this hedgehog position? So there are a couple of things you have to know about the hedgehog that uh, all the trumps and the benefits of the position. Oh, were you about to raise your hand? Sorry. No, no? OK. I misunderstood the cue. Uh, in any case, in these positions, these pawns are strengths and they are weaknesses at the same time. So your goal should be to go after either or. The f pawn isn't really that important. It's more, mostly like a side pawn, which just helps white kind of have a grip on the position. But otherwise, it's not a point of contention. We could play for some sort of ideas of a6 and b5. That is, again, a typical idea. And you're sort of getting closer to what Rapport did. It is the c4 pawn that Rapport is going to go after. Knight to a5. And knight to a5 is actually a multi-purpose move. It puts some pressure on e4, but it also puts pressure on c4. 
Not to mention the sneaky little threat of double attacking the rook on a1 and the bishop on c1. So he's winning a lot of time and also putting pressure on Banas' center. So knight a5, bishop e3. And one thing is to kind of strike the right direction, but really following through what makes a grandmaster a grandmaster, as Rapport will show in this game. He goes bishop a6, and this wasn't just a fad, he's actually going after the c-pawn. So now, Banus counter punches, because he notices that otherwise this could become a big problem. Knight e8, and in fact, and this is what makes the hedgehog so inviting and interesting to play as black, that even though now white grabs a lot of space, black will always get a chance to undermine it with d6, and in very rare cases with f6, because mostly use that pawn to defend your king. It's a guardian pawn. These guys are guardian pawns. You really don't want to push them too much if you don't have to. So knight b5. So it's still a very tense situation. And it is for now, for us, to try to find what Rapport played here. And it's very logical what uh, Rapport did. So one of the crucial things in chess is to wonder why they played the move in the first place. Very good chess. So the first thing you check out is, hey, knight b5 looks defensive, right? It looks like a defensive move. Well, not at all. It's not only defending, it's also attacking that pawn on a7. So it's multi-purpose, just like the moves that Rapport played himself. Now. That pawn is a side pawn, so we're not going to break down in tears if we lose it. But if we make a random move, they might as well just take it. So your next move has to be energetic and aggressive. d5, very good. I've seen plenty of d6s, I've seen d5, I've seen knight b3. d6 feels a little uh, too timid. d5 is even more aggressive, because if you take here, I will always be able to take on c4. If so you take here, I take here, and your knight is trapped. If you take here, I go c takes d3, and I'm going in with my attack. Let me even check here first and then take on d3 with plenty of forks and a king stuck in the middle. And um, this play actually unsettled Banus a lot, who's a grandmaster, obviously. Um, here he thought, oh, I got to go for a solid move, which was a mistake. And one of the specialties of these budding super GMs, as Rapport is, that they know how to up the stake. So here, actually, instead of the move of c takes d5, Banus could have played a very brave move. Something that you wouldn't even think of at the first go. But if you've seen enough superhero movies, you might actually do it. Long castles. An insane move, which I don't fault Banos not finding. And the whole concept is, if you take on c4, bishop takes c4, rook takes c4, this looks completely losing for white. 
However, white has this very nice tactical shot of queen takes c4 because of this pin. Takes, rook takes, bishop takes, knight takes, and this turns out to be good for white because these pieces are a little bit awkward. Otherwise, the bishop pair would uh, definitely compensate for these weaknesses on c4 and b6. However, he got completely unsettled by Rapport's very energetic and aggressive play, which is the staple of his game right to this day, and decided to go for the safe approach of taking on d5. Queen takes d5, knight b4. He's clearly trying to stave away from all the complications. Bishop takes b4, a takes b4. And we're sort of reaching the second phase of the game. First, we had to unsettle our opponent and get a fighting position, which Rapport managed to do so. But this is the second part where you actually have to find a way to capitalize of all the gains you got. Yeah, knight b3 is a good idea, however, I may take your bishop in that case. But you're looking at the right direction. And I'm not sure if I'm telling a big secret. Even grandmasters, they start off looking at candidate moves that may not actually work. But then they realize, hey, what if I do an L reverso and then things start clicking? So we can't quite go knight b3, knight c4 yet. Yeah, our problem mainly is that this bishop is in the way. So we don't have time, people. We don't have time to waste here. No time to lose. We got to capture. Captures knight b3. And uh, before we've been kind of crying about the a7 pawn, but with the king stuck in the center and our pieces swarming on in, Taking here is no business because I can go knight d4 at least, forcing you to trade, otherwise you lose the bishop. And with your king stuck in the middle, your pawns weak on f4 and, b, f4 and b4, you're actually near lost. Because strategically, Rapport is just outplaying his opponent. All those pawns that used to be strong, that f pawn, and even a little bit on the queen side, what a good grip. Not anymore, they're just targets. So actually he didn't go knight b3. He went for knight c4, but it's kind of like the same idea. Knight c4 takes, rook takes, castles. And uh, now we're dominating. We have much better piece placements. However, there is a couple of pieces that Rapport will have to improve if he wants to win this game. So first we have to identify the pieces that are terrible and then look for a solution. Mm -hmm. The knight on e8 is kind of bad, kind of bad there. But if we could have a little dream, can dream a little dream, where would we put that knight? Yeah, that knight is absolutely terrible, Swanisa, I agree. Ideally on d4. Here? Okay. 
which we could get via knight c7, knight d5, knight d4. Yeah, for sure. Any other ideas where this knight would be happy to go to? And find a chill spot. Mm -hmm. Although it's a bit more difficult to get there because the pawn does take away the route. And normally we wouldn't want to touch these pawns. These are guardian pawns. They're there to protect the king. We shouldn't move them if not necessary. However, in chess, you can move your queen, right? So you could get to d5. And that's exactly what Rapport does. So goes knight c7, rook c1, trades, trades, queen d7, and now the knight is hopping to that d5 square. And usually we talk about positions, like more close positions where the knights dominate the bishops. But here it's even better than that because all of these pawns are on dark squares sort of limiting that bishop. So this is, from a, psych a psychological and a positional perspective, is a complete triumph by Richard. Queen c4, now Richie hops into d5, bishop f2, and goes knight e7, trying to control this file. g3, and I really don't like this move of g3. g3 looks logical. Uh, white is trying to over defend. However, look at this diagonal. It becomes all opened up. So rook c8, queen f1, takes, takes, h5. And Rapport is taking full advantage of that, establishing a very good position for the knight on f5, and of course also d5. Queen c4, check here, knight d5. And funnily enough, the material is even, yet black is completely winning. Because that bishop on f2 does not have a single target. It can't blast through those pawns. This knight is monstrous on d5, and this king is absolutely weak. Queen c8 here, queen e8, queen e2. You don't really have time to take here, because I have knight e3 check. Here, then there is mate. If you go here, I don't even bother to take the bishop, and it is checkmate. So you went king g1, and this sort of transposes to the puzzle we started out with. After h4, queen d8, there was queen d1 check, and here white obviously resigned, seeing if he goes king g2, there's knight f4, and he's going to win the queen. So what did we learn, and what is our getaway from uh, this game by Rapport? Well, he built up an aggressive position and uh, sort of believed in the dynamics of chess. He sacrificed the center for quick development, king safety, and lots of aggressive play um, against the e4, c4 pawns. And why just couldn't withstand the pressure and uh, was just too solid in this occasion? Yeah, and in this case, why well, just got overwhelmed? So apart from this game, I definitely wanted to show you this other one where, yeah, go ahead. What was White's decisive mistake? What was White's decisive mistake? I do believe that it's around here, and uh, c takes d5 is sort of the turning point. In every chess game, there is a critical moment. And this was the critical moment where the whole game shifted in Rapport's. Yeah. So c takes takes, maybe knight b4 wasn't exactly the best move, but from here on out, Rapport never gave a single chance, and 
Great point there because this is move 15. And after move 17, oh, it's over. You're done. Rapport isn't going to give you a second chance. You made two inaccuracies and you were done for. So let's look at another game by Rapport where he faced uh, Vargas Zoltan, another grandmaster. And I want you sh to show this that, um, yes, these players are amazing, but it's not like that these games are not hard fought. The other one was more one-sided, but this has some ups and downs. So d4, d5, d takes c4. All you Queen's Gambit fans, you can rejoice because this was a Queen's Gambit. e3, c5 takes. This is the main, main, main line of the Queen's Gambit. Bishop d3, knight c6, knight c3. And incidentally, just recently, Ding Liren played this in the Magnus event against Jordan von Forest, whom is, of course, part of the big dynasty of the Forests. He is a chess playing, that is a chess playing dynasty, and I believe I did a lecture on that too. So if you're interested to know more about the 1800s uh, Forests, well, knock yourself out and take a look. Any case, back to this game, Knight c3. In that game, I believe Jordan played c takes d4. Here, Varga played the rare move of bishop d7. Um, and here's the point of bishop d7. Black wants to go castle, but if he goes now bishop e7, white would capture here, and practically you lost the tempo. And this is actually like those little grandmaster struggles. He's saying, nope, I'm not going to give you a free tempo. If you want to take, be my guest, but then I actually managed to develop my bishop as well. But Rapport caves in and says, well, I'm game. I'm, I want to see you lose that tempo. If you want to develop, I'm not going to help you. Got to do something. Varga says, no, I'm not going to move that bishop unless you capture my pawn. And Rapport goes, okay, deal, because I have the idea of b4. I've got this cute little idea of b4, winning time. Now, this wasn't as good earlier for white because he didn't have a way to gain time. Because now black will have to respond to this b4 idea. Bishop d6. In fact, here, uh, Rapport had a tactical opportunity. But he just doesn't take it. I wonder if you... Guys and girls can see the move here. Dynamics are hard because you can't hold on to a dynamic advantage. Yeah, you got to transform it. Like you have to transform it like Rapport did, creating a tangible advantage of having a knight in the center. But back to this game. Yeah, there is this idea of bishop takes a6, which is a very funny looking move. And if pawn takes, then there's queen takes d6. That's not something you see most of the time. Of course, it's not lost for black. Black can counter take on h2, and you get a weird position. Um, and who knows who's really benefiting from this? Because White will lose a pawn on the king's side while gaining a majority on the queen side. However, Rapport is very bent on going for his plans. So he's never steering away from his concepts. He's always following through. And I think that's one of his biggest strengths, that he's not going for, ah, maybe my opponent missed the free pawn, so I'm just going to do that, but he's just following through the plan that he already set out to do. Queen e7, no more trickies, rook c1. Very straightforward play, 
just getting all of them pieces into the game. Castles. Now, if you go B5, you actually help black to go after the A pawn. You can't really go E4 because that would blunt your own bishop, which of course you don't want. What you really want to do or ought to do is to activate your bishops as much as possible. That is our dream. So it is for you people to try to find this next move by a rapport. And this is actually a very, very nice maneuver slash plan by Ricci. And mind you, if you're just dilly-dallying in this position as white, your advantage will slowly evaporate. You're mostly better because black is yet to finish the development in this position. Okay, knight a4 is interesting. However, you're moving the knight away from the critical zone, which will be in the middle of the board. You're not really going to play on the queen side, more in the center and on the king side. Mm -hmm. It's not the move that he played, but knight e4 is a typical idea and a very sound move. Opens up both bishops and eliminates a very good defender. Like these are usually very, very pleasant positions. He actually played something very similar. He played knight g5, and the idea is to eventually play knight e4 but with a little bit of more oomph in the position. So let's say black completely ignores us, then we may go knight e4, and we have even more pressure on the gnh pawns. Now, of course, uh, Varga saw all of this and played knight e5. And Rapport, again, comes up with a vintage Rapportian idea, thinks outside the box, and comes up with another original plan. So whenever you see a move, you always have to ask yourself, why did Zoltan play knight e5? What was the purpose of that move? Well, the purpose of it all is to try to eliminate this bishop before it could cause a ton of trouble. But Rapport ignores it. And that's a very unique decision, bravely just foregoing the bishop and saying, hey, your pieces are so awkward, it's the momentum that counts, and not really the bishop pair. So after the trade, he is going for this knight ce4 plan. So basically substituting the bishop for the queen. And then the queen is going to act like the bishop in this position. So rook d8, knight e4, takes, takes. And uh, everything is working like clockwork for Ricci, because the queen is double attacking both the h pawn and the b pawn at the same time. And if you hadn't noticed it yet, one of the ways to win a chess game is to double attack. Sometimes you can win 
just by the strength of your position. But most of the cases, 90% of the time, it's a double attack. Because physically your opponent has difficulties of defending both at the same time. Now, Vodga plays f5, which is a great move. Says, okay, I'm going to lose the b-pawn, but at least you're not going to checkmate me. Because if he goes g6, well, you are running the risk of getting mated on the dark squares. f5, queen takes b7. And a lot of times in chess literature, they say, and the rest is technique. You may have heard Yasser say that, and the rest is mere technique. However, the game doesn't really end there. There's still a struggle, as there is still some hope for black to survive. And black keeps on trying, plays a5. So even though it's beyond doubt that Rapport is the one calling the shots, However, black has something to brag about himself. What is those things that actually is looking okay for black? Or is sort of an advantage that he can play on? And it's also a Fisher favorite, mind you. Not really. We do have some pressure on those pawns for sure. But what it is that kind of gives a sliver of hope for Varga to survive is the bishop pair. Exactly. So even though black is worse just down a pawn, he still has something to hope for because this bishop, if it opens up, can in the long run attack these guys. So there's some hope. Rook takes, bishop takes, takes, takes. And so far, so good by Richie. However, Richie here, I'm not sure if he played the right move. I believe he should have taken the A pawn. Bishop c5 and just trade, because one of the things that you should do and always uh, try to follow through, is to go for more trades. Now, this is somewhat uh, obscure, but if rook takes, then there is rook b1, and this a pawn combined with the v king should possibly uh, lead to a win for Rapport sooner or later. So bishop d4 is actually the hard move. So the funny thing about chess is that even when you're winning, there could be some moments you'll have to get into tank and try to find the correct solution. And bishop d4 is not an easy move to make because it does give a pawn back. Otherwise, b takes a5 is not a move that uh, you'd naturally play because it sort of invites bishop c5 and it looks like a doubled pawn. I mean, he played b5, which doesn't spoil anything, However, I feel b takes a5 might have been an easier way. Bishop takes, f takes. So we again talked a bit about defensive skills in chess and just defending positions. What do you think would be the best chance for black here to go for? What would be a good defensive idea here? And of course, when I'm talking defensive, I could also just mean being offensive. Mm -hmm. You could try to trade the rooks and then get into the opposite color ending. That's one way of playing. So even if you get a position like this, you still have to formulate a plan, even though you're the inferior side, you're the side who's trying to hold it all together. Just because you're down upon does not mean you just have to focus on the fence.
Bishop b7? Yeah? Yes. So exactly like that, white is going to face an aggressive rook and bishop combo on the second rank. And this is a typical play, which uh, I highly advise of any levels to try out. Bishop and rook uh, combos are pretty good together. Um, and even though Rapport is still winning, um, the winning, like the technique and the situation is getting a little bit messier. So rook c1, and of course, Varga goes rook d2. So of course, white is winning, but it's not as simple anymore. Bishop e5, very good move by Ricci. He's saying, even if you take this and you take that, now you no longer kind of endanger my king, and I have enough time to activate my rook and then just go b6 and run my pawn down, combined with the threats on the g-pawn. Two threats at the same time? Coincidence? I think not. So, Vargas says, okay, I don't want to get into that business. I'm going to go rook d5 and go after your b-pawn. Rook c7, defending with attacking, because this was a double attack by Varga, but his way of defense is to counterattack himself. So rook takes e5, rook takes b7, rook takes e3. And notice that uh, earlier on we said, oh, free pawn for Richie, easy win. Now we're in a rook end game, not such an easy win. Still winning, no doubt, but there's just more technicalities in a position. However, this is a better ending that you usually get. And I want to ask, what is that huge, big difference between this position and the rook end games we usually get in our own event? There's something that's just much, much better for Richie. The king is cut off, yes, that's one thing, but that's not the only thing. It's not just the fact that the king is cut off. But you're kind of going in the right direction. That's it, king limitations. So yes, partly that the king is cut off, but also the fact that the king is on the eighth. And a lot of times, these rook hand games would be just straight up drawn if the king wasn't stuck there. And I'm going to show it to you. So rook a7, and if black would take a3, we can go b6, rook b3, b7, and most 99% of the time, this is not a problem for black to hold because this pawn can go any further. However, because of the unfortunate place of this uh, king on g8, white is just straight up winning. You can't go here because I just promote with a check. Hit your rook, hit your king. And otherwise, my next move is going to be rook a8 check and b8 queens. So you have no ways of stopping me, and it's all due to this bad king placement. So remember this, if your opponent king is on the first or the eighth, your chances of winning a rook pawn ending is much, much higher. So that's actually the reason why Varga chose rook b3 here. a4, f4. And um, this is a second moment. I really wanted to ask you guys, what would you play here as white? Not, nothing spectacular, just endgame principles, because those exist as well. And well said, rook a7 is a very precise move, 
And one thing that makes Richie such a great player is his precision. Although, this will be sort of a mixed bag and mixed fortunes, but that's sort of part of the deal. But rook a7 was very accurate, I agree. And rook c7 as well, double attack. So what could I mean by endgame principles? What do you need to have in order to have a successful endgame? We've got that. We've got the pass pawn. We've got an active rook, right? So there's a third one that we'd need, and then the situation is just going to unravel in our favor. an active king. And he really should have brought his king over and then the game would have been over pretty soon because his active king is just going to guarantee him victory. He instead went for h4 which is an exciting idea but maybe not as good as bringing the king in. If you could choose uh, bringing the king in, you should. Not saying that h4, h5, h6 doesn't have a deep plan, and in fact, everyone is uh, like padding computers in the back, virtually, virtually only. But uh, you can see that Richie, at the age of 13, 11 months, he does push h4, h5, h6. So maybe this whole plan wasn't so new after all. Now the whole concept is the following. He's trying to put even more pressure on that king on g8 and on these pawns on h7 and g7. So e5, h5, and for example, if black would ignore all these, white could go g6, takes, takes, and already you have this mating idea. If you go here, I check you. If you go here, I have this method of, again, threatening checkmate and trying to take the e pawn. So, rook f7, king e8, rook takes g7, and of course this is winning because you not only have one passer with the b pawn, but another one with the g pawn. So, of course, Varga wants none of this business. g6, h6, and he's establishing the same thing. e4, and here actually, uh, Richie makes a suboptimal move. But uh, let's be fair here with the players, which oftentimes just doesn't happen that much. Time trouble. We're on move 32. They reach control at 40, where they get additional time. Here, of course, he should have gone rook g7 check, and then after you go here, here, and you're just winning the same way we discussed. But uh, nerves is part of playing a Grandmaster event. Don't forget, this is for Grandmaster Norm. So he plays rook e7, and rook e7 turns out to be not so good. In fact, if here black found the move e3, king f1, rook b4, this probably is closer to a draw than anything else because suddenly black will have counter chances with the rook and pawn and you don't really have enough time anymore to win the pawn there. But of course, both of them in time trouble plays rook b4. b6. Rook takes b6, rook takes e4, rook b4. So for now, we have to find the way to win for us. I could even imitate a time trouble situation. You've got 15 seconds, 14, 
Look, he's seven, okay. Twelve seconds. Eight. Seven. Six. Guess, give a check, okay. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. That's it. That's all the time you have. You don't have more time to spare. You flag, you lose the game. So he did find rookie eight, so that was correct, as Danny pointed out. Rookie eight check, king f7, and in the nick of time, uh, Richie gets towards the h-pawn, wins the h-pawn. And this is actually the benefit of pushing the pawn up the board. Not only do you have some mating patterns, but that pawn is very, very, very close to promote. So rook takes a4, check. King g8. Now, this is not your traditional situation. Usually you get only an h pawn there, which isn't quite enough. However, in this case, this pawn is protected. This is a protected passer, so it's even better. And this position by now is again completely winning. King g8, check. Rook takes g6, rook a3. Rook f6, and here black resigned because next move is going to be g6, and there is absolutely no way you can stop me. And even if you go here, I go check you here, and I could just queen and style with rook f8. The rook obviously is taboo because I promote with a check, and it is game over. So I really hope all of you enjoyed this lesson of how to become a grandmaster. As we discussed, a couple of critical games of Richard Rapport, who became a grandmaster at age 13, 11 months. So I hope to see you guys in the future as well with many, many more journeys to come. Thank you so much for watching.